Welcome, Carm Capriato, the Service Aftermarkets Podcast Pioneer with the gold standard of aftermarket business podcasts. <clears throat> Join me for aftermarket insights as we advance the aftermarket. And as always, know that you'll learn just one thing. Find us on your favorite podcast listening app and RemarkableResults.biz or on my YouTube channel. Hey everybody, Carm Capriato, Remarkable Results Radio. Good to have you here. We are talk radio for the professional auto service aftermarket. Don't forget, listen to learn just one thing. And today, I guarantee you, you're going to learn an awful lot. I have two very distinguished members of the automotive aftermarket with me. A friend of mine for a bunch of years, Dr. John Passante. Hello, John. Hello, Carm. Good to be with you. Golly, I'll never forget when I attended what they call today Leadership 2.0. It was called 2010 at the time. John, and you came in and spoke to us, and you've probably never missed one in the last 20 years, I bet. Almost 30. <laughs> I was being kind. I was being kind. Anyway, Dr. John's a legacy automotive aftermarket HR professional and the president and CEO of the Organizational Development Group. He's worked with, and for some of the biggest names in our industry, listen to this, Monroe, Tenneco, Delphi, Moog, CarQuest. His resume is so big that it takes up three or four pages. Likewise, Dr. Thomas Litzinger. Thomas, did I get that right? Yes, sir. You did, Carm. Comma, AAP. I have that too. Does your AAP mean the same thing as mine? I believe it does. I believe uh, it does. That, it's that industry designation. Yeah. So thanks, Carm, for having us. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for everything you're doing for our industry. And we are very grateful. Thank you so much. Executive Director Dr. Thomas is and the chair of the University of the Aftermarket at Northwood University. Oof, very prestigious college. Dr. Thomas is an award-winning trainer, educator, and automotive aftermarket executive with 30 years in the distribution, manufacturing, and retail in the automotive aftermarket. Wow. So are we going to talk about education? Yeah. Are we going to talk about some real heavy leadership stuff? Sure we are. And I really do want to get into what's going on with the University of the Aftermarket. Love to know what the focus of 2.0 is all about. And here's the really cool thing. I know some service professionals that own shops and technicians that are getting involved in this Next level up, Thomas. What's going on with that? Carm, that's absolutely fabulous. I'll just start by saying under the University of the Aftermarket, we have five pillars. The five pillars represent our one on one coursework or our introductory coursework, our Leadership 2.0, and Heavy Duty 2.0, which is tactical leadership. We have our executive leadership programming, which is Infusion, which we'll be hosting in Hamburg, Germany. And that's first week of June. Then we have our data standards, of course, supporting our aces and pies in the industry and all of these catalog content managers that work so hard behind the scenes. We're developing coursework for them. And then we have our corporate development pillar, which organizations come into us and say, hey, can you develop this for our organization? We want it to kind of look like this. And then we go to our bullpen of speakers and we craft that. So that's what we're up to. And personally, I also attended Leadership 2.0 CARM, met Dr. John there. The experience transformed my life, put me on the trajectory that I'm on today that I just want to do more. I want to learn more. I want to be this lifelong learner. And Dr. John had a played a huge role in that. So just Dr. John, thank you for all you've done. And I'm just very grateful. So a lifelong learner, Dr. John, a lifelong learner. That's a powerful statement. Well, Carb, if you think about it, it's interesting because in today's society, we every day we read and process words because we're connected 24-7, which is both good and bad. And so when I say the word a lifelong learner, I wonder, and by the way, instead of calling them service providers, I call them solution providers. Because when my when I need my car, you know, keeps us on the road 24-7, God bless the aftermarket. The ladies and, men and women that work on those technology, et cetera, they're solution providers. And so as part of leadership, you start with yourself and say, am I a lifelong learner? And learning means you take some time to try stuff new. And I don't know about you, two gentlemen, but early in my life, I had both good and bad experience in learning where I would have teachers that would embarrass students because they didn't have the right answer in front of the class. And so my cry to the people today about leadership is starting with yourself to be a lifelong learner. 
and to read and to try different things and express to the people you touch every day that learning is not painful. Harken back to my days at Moog Automotive, which I had a wonderful career there with Larry McCurdy, God rest his soul. We introduced something called SAP. And I don't know if you both had experience with SAP. Would it that be the computer software? Yeah, it, it, it changed all the software from everybody to over top smiling. And of course, we, it was seen as a IT project. And some of our employees fought it. <coughs> and so McCurdy again calls me and he says, okay, John, solve it. I formed a cross-functional team and I set sales, marketing, operations, human resources, distribution, sales at all levels. And I said, we're going to learn together what SAP is all about. We took the fear out of it. We encourage an environment where it's okay to question. And I, again, I, if you look at people today in the aftermarket community, if I'm a new hire, do you encourage me to question what you say to me? Or is there a fear factor? And again, Carmen and Thomas, this gives me gray hair. Only 8% of the human beings reach, reach their potential. And potential is the God-given talents that we have. And I wonder if we open the door and let people know. And I don't like the term learning disability because we all learn differently. I think about the people that made a difference in my life that helped me instead of making me feel incompetent or not enough or not good enough. And any potential that I've reached is because, yes, I've worked hard at it. And yes, I'm a lifelong. Go ahead, Kirby. You want to say something? You were, yeah, but you were challenged too. I mean, I think that that's a key here, being challenged. Yes. It, 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 let's go back to the fact that I remember in fifth grade, I couldn't get my 12 times tables right. And my teacher said, Carm, Mr. Capriato, your dad's going to be very disappointed if you don't get this, because if you join the family business and you don't know this, <laughs> I'll never forget it as long as I live, right? It's how many years ago I, he challenged me to be better at it. And those, I think, are some great learning moments that come out of our life. Carb, I always, uh, you know, I have a prayer list, if you don't mind, but what, Sister Bernadine, my eighth grade sister, St. Thomas Aquinas, East Toledo, Ohio, I was a typical eighth grader and a B student. And, and every, I was a captain of the basketball team, and every week we got graded on behavior. And if we didn't get a B, we couldn't play basketball on Saturday. So the bell rings, posted on the door as you left the classroom, an alphabetical order with everybody's name with a grade for the week. So the bell rings, Friday afternoon, I'm ready to go home. I walk up to the door, go down the list, John Anthony Passati. Behavior, B minus. <laughs> All of a sudden, Sister Bernadine says, Mr. Passati. I said, yes, sister. Close the door, get a chair, and sit in front of my desk. Trust me, didn't say no to Sister Bernadine. So I sit down. She waits for 30 seconds or so. It seems like a long time. She's staring at me and says, Mr. Passati. I said, yes, sister. What did you learn today? I said, sister, you gave me a break. She said, yes, young man, you, I did. What are you going to do about it? I, sis, sis, I said, sister, I will become a student. Mr. Passanti, have a good weekend. I take that with me, Carm. I became a student. I graduated first in the class. At graduation, I got a special award. I walked on the stage. And I'm not ashamed to say I had tears in my eyes. And so did Sister Bernadine. We hugged each other. That's the kind of leadership I'm talking about in the aftermarket is, look, we're, none of us are perfect. And it takes patience to be a, a parent. It takes patience to be a leader and develop. Are the young people coming into the industry today different? Yes, they are. Are my grandchildren different? Yes, they are. Do they challenge me? Yes. That's what I'm talking about, potential. It's not just a feel-good concept. It's real life. And I worry about people in society today that no one's ever opened that door to show that vision to say, yes, you can. Dr. Thomas, what a, it's a great story. I love your story. But it looks like John was admitting that he was going to change. And I think that's part of one of the biggest problems that we have in our industry is that there are too many that are on autopilot. That is absolutely correct. It's having that desire 
to change, number one, and be more, to be that lifelong learner, but also to have that mentor behind you, encouraging you, guiding you, and offering feedback. To Dr. John's point, we all make mistakes, right? We're all far from perfect. But when you have someone that's compassionately guiding you, oh, what a huge difference it can make for us. Thomas, you're right. I mean, employees talk to me. I do executive coach. They hate the annual review process because it's like going to the dentist without Novocaine. <laughs> and, I mean, if your wife only tells you she loves you once a year, I think you're in trouble. And so as you, <laughs> I mean. Well, I have, uh, I've never heard it like that before. I mean, talk to your employees. If something's, you're displeased about <coughs> something, talk to them right away. Say, I like to make, you know, don't criticize them. I like to make an observation. Am I correct or not correct? Because I love to learn from people with all kinds of backgrounds. And again, you have to keep your mind open and say, some, some people in life think they have all the answers. I always say, some people think they have the name of the unknown soldier. And we, none of us have the answer. And so to Thomas's point is, we have to be able to control our ego. We all have an ego. And there's good parts of ego and there's bad parts of ego. But the ego is, okay, I want to be the best person I can be, but not at the expense of anybody else. Yeah, that's good ego. I got a question for Dr. Thomas. Listen, Leadership 2.0 is really an incredible aftermarket learning. It's, it's a year-long program. I do believe it still is. You meet twice. You got a project in the middle. You present the project. And then somebody has a chance, I think, to go to, what, Apex to present? No, we no longer do that. We used to present at GAS. We don't do that anymore. And we don't, but they present their team projects on the last day of our time okay. together on the second week. And we vote for that team presentation. And the winner is awarded with mutual respect from their peers and colleagues and fellow students at 2.0. I guess where I'm driving to is you must be very much in charge or responsible for the topics and the things that you're covering in Leadership 2.0. And we'll get a link in the show notes on getting there and taking a look at it. When you hear Dr. John talk, when you're plugged in, you're reading articles, you're very connected in the industry. Are these kinds of trends that are going on affect the kind of classes and the people that you get to come in and talk? Sure. So I have recently done some research on organizational culture, culture of an organization, shared values, shared beliefs, shared behaviors. That comes from the top. That has to come from the leader of the organization. But CARM, the pandemic had such a adverse impact on our organizations. When folks first started to work remote, <clears throat> it was new, it was bright, it was shiny. They were using drive times to get to work earlier and it was all motivated. But now as we are several years in, we're finding that isolation, if you will, is contributing decreased levels of efficiency, social isolation, our anxiety and our depression are increasing. And it's just because they don't have that human touch and the camaraderie, if you will, of the workplace. And this is critical. In that, and in 2.0, it's what we encourage our learners to discover about this and this hidden gem of a leader that's inside you that we're trying to bring out, that we're trying to present techniques that will help you be this person that'll go back to your organizations after the session and make a huge difference and create a culture where the values are respect and courtesy and those type of things. It's so important. And without them, organizations struggle. They may be successfully financially, but as far as providing life satisfaction for their team members, they're falling short of the mark. I have a, a comment to make on this. As Leadership 2.0 is all about personal development, business development, leadership development, I can't help but think it's very much like Toastmasters to gain confidence in speaking because we have a remarkable results radio virtual Toastmasters organization. And it's great. And, you know, I've been in it for nine months now and I do this for a living. And man, did I learn stuff and gain confidence in certain areas. 
And that's what 2.0 is all about. It is. Again, it's bringing out that hidden gem inside of individuals, developing their tactical leadership skills for them to go back and make a difference in their organizations. And and aren't there suppliers willing to give scholarships to bring service professionals and technicians in? So we have a very robust relationship with the University of the Aftermarket Foundation who supports our Leadership 2.0 and our heavy Duty 2.0 cohorts with scholarships, AWDA supports it, and the AWDA scholarship program is specifically designed to bring the technician into this coursework because they offer such a robust perspective of the industry. They see it differently than the rest of us. They're on the ground level, if you will. And let's just face it, Carm, all the channels of distribution above them are anxious to get their perspective and how can we develop meaningful content for that relationship between our warehouse distributors, between the manufacturers, the program distribution groups, and that professional technician. It's critical. How how many were at the last session? We swung and missed at the last session. I believe we had two where our goal is to have eight. And the class is what, about 50? Uh, This year's class was 31. 31, and you had two technicians, and correct. the goal is to have eight. That is correct. Okay. So we typically want a class of 40. We want eight technicians. We want 20% of that class to be professional technicians. Okay. If someone was listening now and say, wow, I've got to get involved, or I've got to go to a supplier, point is that, where do we go to get more information? Well, I'm happy to provide any information that any of your listeners would need. Certainly our friends at AWDA, our program distribution groups, are well aware of this program. And we are already, even though the first week of Leadership 2.0, 24-25 is in August, we are already recruiting for this valuable uh, content from the professional technician. Is there, are there still openings for August? There are. Okay. There are. And is there a website that we could go to at least see what's going on with it or even maybe submit an application? No, Carm, I don't have that. Forgive me for that. I don't have that, but it's something that I can certainly get for you. Okay, great. Just assuming that someone can just go into, I just drew a blank here, University of the Aftermarket Leadership 2.0. I'm sure something would come up. Yes. Okay. And Carm, have that individual contact their local WD that's in a program distribution group, all of those folks are aware of the program. Point well taken, we should have a special link for that. So assignment number one for me. So thank you for that. Got it, okay. Hey, it's no secret, we're facing a technician shortage and Napa Auto Care has a solution with the Napa Auto Care Apprentice Program. The program was pioneered by one of our own. Pete McNeil and Master Technician Jake Sorensen from McNeil's Auto Care in Sandy, Utah, realized that the problem of not having technicians available for hire was not going to solve itself and decided to take action and look at a different audience of individuals available for hire. A focus was put on younger individuals with the right passion, desire, and attitude to work in the automotive repair industry. Jake and Pete sought after these individuals and developed a technician apprentice program to give them the training needed to become a successful technician in today's world. The NAPA Auto Care Apprentice Program includes a comprehensive nine-stage curriculum that includes a variety of types of training, and they are classroom training videos exclusive to the apprentice program. Now, these videos provide in-depth training from a successful master technician. Also, Autotech classes with instructor-led courses offered through Napa Autotech and Autotech eLearning. This web-based eLearning is designed to target specific training topics. And finally, hands-on learning. The apprentice will apply the skills gained from the classroom training videos, Autotech instructor-led training, and Autotech eLearnings in the shop with the guidance of a mentor. The apprentice program curriculum is competency-based, meaning an apprentice can move through each stage at a pace that best suits them. Most apprentices complete the program within two years. Upon completion, apprentices will have earned ASC G1, A4, A5, and AC certifications, adding industry validation to the skills an apprentice acquires. Look, having an apprentice in your shop will ultimately benefit your bottom line as they advance through the program. And in most cases, as the apprentice develops their skill set producing billable hours, you'll begin to see a growth in your gross profit by stage five. One of the largest barriers to entry for individuals looking to enter the automotive repair industry 
is the cost of tools. Now, keep your apprentice motivated with an apprentice toolkit. Now, Napa Auto Care has worked with our supplying partners to offer an exclusive comprehensive tool set, including a four-drawer tool card for all registered apprentices. Hey, to learn more, members can visit member.napaautocare.com. The power of the human spirit. I just always love to hear you talk about that. Well, if you think about people that come together with a common cause. Again, John F. Kennedy said, we're going to go to the moon. I'm old enough to remember when he said that. And some people were doubting. He put together the best minds in the world, not just Americans. Guess what? We went to the moon. And so the human spirit has no limits. If you think about technology today, if you think about medicine, I remember when polio was a fear of any child growing up. Today, God willing, it's under control. If you think about the changes in our in the society today and hopefully going forward, the human spirit is, is like the human potential, Carm. It has no limits. If we collectively put our minds, our hearts, and our souls together, and I'm a humanist. I believe there's more good in people than bad. Have I been hurt by people? Absolutely. Have I been taken advantage of? Absolutely. Do I carry a grudge? Not so much anymore. I'm a Sicilian. I got over it. And so if I approach life that way to say, look, we're all here to make life better. That's what we do as parents. That's what we do as leadership. And so the human spirit comes from the brain, the heart, and the soul. And this human spirit's a, a gift. I mean, you talk about attitude. That's a choice we make every morning. You wake up. I say to myself, I'm thankful for the day, and I'm going to make it a good day. Come hell or high water, I'm going to make it a good day. And so that's what I mean about, and you read stories about Helen Keller, if you ever heard it or watched the movie about Helen Keller, and Annie Sullivan was her teacher. Mm -hmm. And Annie taught her to, she, she taught her to, Helen Keller to speak, to write, and she had a wonderful life, even though she was severely handicapped. That's just an extreme example. But that, that's back to the human potential. Is there, that's why they're all connected. The human spirit, the potential, lifelong learning are not just nice words and concepts. That's the essence of humanity. And we all, believe it or not, we're all going to have a legacy. And people are going to look back and say, well, did this person make a difference? This make a di not make a difference? And, and then we have our own legacy that we think about. And I look at things I've done in my life that I wish I had done. And hopefully I get better at that. And so that's what I mean about the, the human spirit. It's just like if today super Sunday's a Super Bowl Sunday and some you know teams come together and everybody pulls their weight. Sometimes the best team doesn't win, but they overcome the other team's talents because they have a common goal. I've seen that in industry. I've seen that when we all remember when price re companies cut prices and you had to compete or go out of business. And I've seen people come together and say, okay, how do we compete? And again, an example I had that when I was with other companies where the president said, John, we got to lay off 10% because so-and-so cut their prices. And I said, give me a couple of weeks, call people together cross-functionally we came up with cost reductions and not lost, not one person lost their job. And so you got, again, that's thinking, is that being a lifelong learner? I think so. Is that endorsing the human spirit and putting people before profits? Yes. And, and Carmen and, and Thomas, I always wonder when people put their budgets together at year end or before the year end, is there a goal in there about people developing? You know what I find out? It's just, I love to listen to John talk. He just... He says, we have to cut payroll by 10%. He goes, give me a minute. And he goes back. He works with the people. There are so many people that probably owe you their job, but they don't even know that you had that. You decided to figure out, you, you pull the team together a common goal. You said that. And Thomas, you were talking about culture before. Together with a common goal, probably an awful lot of value sets to discuss. But there are too many service professionals that are running around and running their business in a non-culture. I'll take your word for that, Carm. I, I admire the work that they do, but certainly there are 
programs within the University of the Aftermarket that challenges them to become good business people as well. Look, everyone acknowledges their incredible skill. Look, it's not easier, easy these days to diagnose a vehicle with the computers and all the things that are going on. I can't even speak to it because that is not one of my skill sets, but we know that is so difficult. But then what we bring to that party, Carm, is that, hey, we'll train them financially. We'll train them how to look at a cash flow statement, a balance sheet, and a financial acumen is a huge part of our leadership 2.0 and 101 programs to help develop them, right? Again, we our goal is to contribute to the human condition, we that life satisfaction, if you will, it's my passion. And certainly we want to equip our professional technicians to be successful on the highest level, financially, leadership, all of it. Well, you both are doing such great things for our industry. John, are you still working hard every day or did you slow down? I've slowed down a little bit, but I, I don't want to become irrelevant. And plus, I try to keep my mind active. So I, uh, I'm still doing executive coaching. I do a little bit of recruiting. Uh, I help people pro bono who lose their, who've lost their jobs. I write resumes for them and do some uh, interviewing skills training. And I still write articles for the aftermarket news. And on a personal side, I've written two children's books on kindness because my 16-year-old granddaughter, who's my hero, Sophia, has type 1 diabetes. And I'm hopefully going to raise money to fight diabetes with my books. But the industries in my blood has been good to my family, helped me raise my children, good standard of living. And so uh, people say, John, when are you going to retire? I said, I'm retiring. I'm doing what I want to do. I work for a good boss, me. <laughs> so, And if I can, I just want to hitchhike on what Thomas said. Part of a leadership 2.0 is people come to that and they may or may not be quite sure why they're there. And Thomas and I and the, the, some of the other presenters, you, you've heard me say it, Thomas, the first day of session, I asked a question because I like participation. I tell people I'm not a talking head. I'm here because I want to learn. I want to sh share ideas, but I'm, I want to get what's the back. I want some feedback here. And so we worked very hard to let them know they're there because, A, the company they sent them thinks a lot of them. And this may blow your mind, Carm. They're surprised. And then I say, raise hands. How many of you get enough compliments? Sadly, maybe, right, Thomas, maybe 20, 30 percent of raise hands. A compliment is sincere. Can't be a phony. You can't be a con job. For God's sake, compliment. I compliment. I went to UPS today. Young man waited on me over there, probably 22 years old, whatever. I went to his boss and I said, David does an outstanding job every time I'm here. And David could hear me. And so we make sure at Leadership 2.0 that this is about you. This four or five days is about. And then I asked the question, how many of you have enough time to do all the things you want to do? Zero hands go up because we're all time poor. I know you well enough, Carm. I know you, Thomas, my friend, you guys work seven days a week like I do, even though I'm semi-retired. I'm on a computer on Sunday. My wife said, what are you doing? Oh, I'm doing some fun stuff. She said, get off. <laughs> like, okay, honey. Have you been at my house watching? Uh, yeah, there's a camera at your house. Yeah, I thought so. Hmm. <laughs> no. yeah. And so leadership, and, and then Thomas can tell you this. The first day of the session, I hand out, and James O'Dell and Thomas helped me. We give everybody an envelope. And I say, at the end of the day today, you write yourself a letter. What do you want to achieve this year? Personal and professional. Give me the letters back. I seal it in front of them. I'm not going to read it. And sometime when I feel like it, I'll mail it, I'll mail it to you. It may be a <laughs> month, maybe six months, who knows? I go to Apex car, a thousand people with the first night at a cocktail party, right? Oh, yeah. The guy comes up, Dr. John, can I talk to you? I said, sure. Goes in a sport coat, a ratty looking piece of paper. 1997, Dr. John, this is what I wrote about myself self development. The goals we set for ourselves are more endeared to us than the, the business. And I'm not saying business goals are not important. My modest friend Thomas has it said, leadership 2.0 is about the entire person. And again, companies forget that when they hire somebody, they hire their technical skill. This is a good accountant. I said, yeah, they are. Guess what? 
They're also a person with interests, with ideas, with concerns, maybe with fears. And I'm not trying to get too heavy here, but when you manage people, the way they go home at night, the way they talk to their family is a direct proportion of how you treat them. This was a very powerful last five minutes. I love what you said. It's all about the person. And you go to 2.0 because it's all about you. But th- th- what I took away was I needed to be a b- better leader way back when I went to 2010. It was the precursor name before right. it was 2.0. And, and I I have to tell you, you got to. it's got to sink in with what John just said. It's about the person. Yeah, I don't think we... There's a work family that we, sometimes we totally forget that they have particular needs, just like your home family would, but we don't necessarily respect it, take care of it, talk to them as if we were nurturing people and they were here working for you. All about maybe professional, personal gain, finance or career. And we have to do a much better job inside of our industry. Now, listen, I know the top 20 percent. They're all on board. They get this. But so much of the goal that I have has always been that next 10 or 15% in the industry who listen and say, wow, there's something I just learned. Listen to learn just one thing, as I've always said. But to everyone's point, there's so much incoming. We're so time challenged that, oh, ooh, great idea. Write it down. And it fades. And I guess one of the biggest things that we have to think about is how do we take some critically important things we need to do in our lives and get it on that top 10 list? So, Carm, I'll just say this. I would love for the executives listening to your show today to ask ask themselves this question. How can I contribute to the life satisfaction of my team members? How can we change how we integrate our organizational culture into that question and how can they start to make a difference? Because the typical CEO will say, oh my goodness, we can't afford stuff like that. My response to that, Carm, is you can't afford not to do that. And training and development is key. Research shows that retention, employee morale, employee engagement, proficiency is closely correlated to high levels of personal development. Yeah. And all of this would just contribute to what they're trying to accomplish, but they're just going about it in a different way, a more meaningful way, if you will. This is this is an inspiring episode. I think it's tight, it's succinct. I think there's been a lot of passion served here from both John and Thomas. I got so many other things going on in my mind, but I love where we left this thing. Contribute to life satisfaction. Another huge takeaway from you, uh, Dr. Thomas. I appreciate that. Guys, thank you so much for being here and getting us up on board with uh, Leadership 2.0 and all the great HR wisdom and the people passion that uh, my friend, Dr. John Passante has. John, you always so passionate and so profound. And and maybe it's not because you're Sicilian. I just think you were born to to change people's lives. Oh, thank you. You touched my heart. You're a special man. I remember when you first started doing what you're doing. And you and I spent some time talking about a car, but you're making a difference. And that's what it's all about. I mean, that's what it's all about. And real quick story, if I could, I was with a major after OE company and the chairman of the board called me over one day, president, and said, I don't get the aftermarket. His whole life, he was a GM. I said, look out the window. What do you see? He got up from his million dollar desk and I said, look out the window. He said, I said, trees. No, look out a little further. Well, I see cars and trucks. I said, good observation. I said, that's the aftermarket. 24-7, there's cars and trucks going up on that highway, on I-75. The aftermarket keeps them on the road 24-7, 365 days a year. That's an awesome responsibility. And we've got to get that message to the young people joining our industry. Is the aftermarket changing? Yeah. Is electronics coming? Yeah. The driverless car? Yeah, probably. But there's always going to be an aftermarket. I recruited high schools, Carm, because high schools always want somebody to come in and talk to the students. And I tell them about the excitement of the aftermarket. And it is a technical, it's both technical and practical. And anyway, I, it's, I can't express what I feel about the aftermarket. But that's, again, I'm, 
I'm excited to be here today with you and my friend Thomas and you, my friend Carm. Let's do it again. You just nailed it. Storytelling. And, and I, I think we're not doing enough of it as an industry to get into the high schools and get into the colleges. In fact, oh, God, get up on my soapbox again. I, I was in speaking to a college group, me and a whole bunch of other shop owners, about two, three months ago. And these shop owners were introduced as mom and pops. And I said, John and Tom, I says, I can't let this go. <laughs> and I had to get up. <laughs> and, and, I, and I had to get up and I had to say, whoa, because the week before there were a whole bunch of dealers there. And of course, now then the independents were invited the next week to talk to this particular class. And I said, okay, I can't let that go. To your point, we are, this industry is big. It is professional and it is. And if we pay attention to being great leaders and the tech, the technology that's coming at us and we become more agile and all encompassing and smart with really great cultures and we can go on and on. There's another hundred things, but this was great. Dr. Thomas Litzinger, AAP, the executive director and chair of the University of the Aftermarket Northwood University and Dr. John Passante. A legacy automotive aftermarket HR professional and the president and CEO of the organizational development group. Guys, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having us, Carmen. Thank you so much. Thank you.